I realized there are unique, outrageous acts of love that can be committed by me and me alone, and that is the unique purpose, obligation, joy, and responsibility. It's my ability to respond to reality. That's my outrageous act of love. A planetary awakening in love through a unique self-symphony. What a privilege it is to be part of this global community. There's a voice within me that asks, who am I, right? Who am I in all of this? Each and every one of us has a unique gift to give that we desperately need. Welcome to the heart of the revolution, everyone. It is with deep joy that we are together in one mountain, many paths. Our mission is what Barbara Marks Hubbard and Dr. Mark Goffney call a planetary awakening in love through unique self symphonies. We are activating a new humanity and awakening as a new species, homo amor, the fulfillment of homo sapiens. As a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, a zendo, no one is excluded, everyone is included, and we come together to attune to the evolutionary impulse awakening within us. Welcome home, everyone. I am Christina Tahel, the co-executive producer, along with Krista Josefa, Jamie Long and Jacqueline Clark, and we are so delighted to be together with each and every one of you today for our 309th live community broadcast. What a privilege it is to be part of a global community that contributes to humanity's flourishing. Use the Zoom and the Facebook chat functions to say hello to let us know where you're from, to resonate the Dharma, and to speak your prayers. On Zoom, do check that your chat settings say everyone so that we can all hear from you. Care to step deeper into community through the work and practice of creating the great Homo Amor Library? We are a thriving community and work group. Reach out to Krista for the holy opportunities. Her email is in the chat box now. Our weekly gathering, Writing to the Evolutionary Love Codes, where we meet each Monday to alchemize the uh, evolutionary love codes we are working with um, will happen again tomorrow, and members receive an email with the details. If you don't receive the email, I personally invite you to step closer in to hold your center of this community. And I'd love to deepen in contemplative writing with you. On September 24th, as part of launching the Unique Self Institute, we will resume our Saturday study group, diving into awakening your unique self with Claire Molinar, David Sacerci, and myself. Sign up for One Mountain membership to join part one of this course. Dr. Mark Goffney will join us in part two to share the evolution of the unique self Dharma. For more information, go to the one mountain many website. The link is in the chat box now. We wanna welcome Dr. Mark Goffney back today. He's been away for six weeks doing holy and important work and allowing the unique self symphony to step in and radiate out the teachings and the Dharma together, holding hands with Dr. Mark. And we welcome him back and please do also you welcome him back by putting your welcome into the chat box now. What to expect today? First, a Dharma recap from myself from last week. Then Dr. Mark will set our intention, and then David will resonate that evolutionary love code. Then we step into our evolutionary sermon with Dr. Mark, and then we move into meditation to enter prayer. 
Krista invites us deeper into community and to close, we bring people on for our goodbyes and a short dance party. I welcome all who are new. We need you. If this is your first time, these teachings do stand on their own and every week builds on previous teachings. We do encourage you to listen to previous episodes. Today, you will hear unique language. Trust the magic ways the language or dharma comes through your understanding. One mountain, many paths is radically committed to telling the new universe story. Now for my recap from last week's One Mountain. Becoming homo amor, living erotically in every dimension of life. Last week, Krista, Josepha, and I explored how to liberate our lives in Eros, how to live in a field of Eros and intimacy, and how everything is fundamentally interconnected. The invitation was to animate reality and our lives with the new story of cosmoerotic humanism. We are in an evolutionary context. We live in a time between stories, a time between worlds, and we're facing catastrophic and existential risk. So why talk about Eros in the midst of all of this? Why is Eros important? As I quoted last week from Dr. Mark Offney and Christina Kincaid's A Return to Eros, a desire to survive is just that, an interior desire that is built into the deepest fabric of reality, all the way up and all the way down. The drive to survive is an erotic interior. Existential risk can feel overwhelming. There's a gap between our ability to feel and our ability to heal the pain in the world. We cross that gap by realizing that we are not a separate self, but we are a unique expression of reality and that our unique life actually participates in this larger field of evolution. In other words, our unique personal transformation actually participates in the larger transformation of all of reality. When we realize that, we can actually become sacred activists, homo amor, and we can consciously choose our actions, contribute to what we call outrageous acts of love, and consciously participate in the evolution of love. Knowing all of this, it becomes deeply interesting to ask the questions, how do we give that erotic, ecstatic yes to cosmos, over and over again. We need a new narrative to hold the fullness of Eros. In the lineage of the Hebrew mystics, they actually say that sexuality is the seed of all wisdom, that sex models Eros, but doesn't exhaust it. If we stop using sexuality to cover up our emptiness and actually, as it were, bow down to sexuality and say, what can you teach me about life? Krista Josepha quoted from a return to Eros. Built into the sexual is an enormous desire to give, particularly to give pleasure. In virtually all arenas of living, most of us are perpetually on the prowl for the best deal or getting the most while giving the least, the win-lose metrics. The great exception is the sexual. Because in sex, being a great lover is taken to mean that you give your partner an unbelievable, unforgettable experience. Yet, we need to expand this desire to give, to apply to so much more than just sex. The erotic of giving must engage every facet of existence. So that is the invitation, together and in our lives becoming the erotic mystic in every moment, through all of our interactions, paying attention to this intimate universe, this universe that is just so mysterious and so full of eros and outrageous love and outrageous pain. So we regenerate, we evolve, 
and we reanimate our world with intimacy and arrows. Now I invite us to more deeply enter into the holy and sacred spaces of one mountain, many paths, and I turn my word to you, beloved Dr. Mark Goffman. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Christina Amelon, for that wide-ranging and wondrous Dharma recapitulation. It is great to be with you, Christina, and it's great to be with you, everyone. And it's just, a, it's, a, it's a hugely wonderful and important moment. I first want to just welcome you to Vermont. I'm sitting at a, the new location of the center. The center now created a space in Vermont. I'm actually sitting in that space and we're very, very excited to have this space. It's a place where I'm going to be actually living. Zach Stein will be living here. Of course, Christina, my little son, Zion. We have several rooms for fellows and scholars. And the reason we made this movement was in order to launch to the next level the work on the great library right, of cosmorotic humanism, which is the fundamental response to the meta crisis that we're engaged in at such a deep level. Now, I want to welcome everyone, whether you're here for the first time, and let me just take a look in the chat box. Who's here? If you're here for the first time, just give us a hello in the chat box. So anyone who's here for the first time, just, just jot in your name, All right? Welcome. Jessica, welcome to you. I know this is not the first time. I know you just started working with Krista, right? And, you know, Seb, welcome, right? Just so fantastic and gorgeous. Eddie, welcome. First time. Welcome to anyone, right, around the world, right, who's, who's here for the first time. And I want to really locate where we are, right? What is this one mountain, many paths? What are we, what are we doing here, right? What's, what's the, the, the play, right? What's the sacred play, right, at this moment in time? And so let's kind of step back and kind of understand where we are. And I want to, want to talk to you just in a kind of fireside kind of way. Right? In other words, what's, what's going on in the world now? Okay? So we're in this moment, friends, which is a time between worlds. We're in a time between stories. If you want to imagine and feel what that moment's like, think Renaissance. Think the moment in which the pre-modern world, the traditional world, with everything that it, it, it thought it knew about God and about man and about woman and about desire and about power, all of that was crashing. Right? All of the assumptions upon which people built their lives was becoming, in the language of the Oxford philosopher C.S. Lewis, a discarded image, right? a discarded image image of reality. And as that image was being discarded, technology was ramping up. Technology, paradoxically, was the inception of, it's too big of a story to tell now, the inception of the Black Death, right? The pestilence, the plague, the pandemic that swept Europe at that same moment. And people had no idea how to respond. People had no, no idea what to do because it was clear that the old world story, that the old world was insufficient to respond, and yet the new world hadn't been born. And history was afoot. And she, the force of Eros that moves reality, that an erotic mystic feels in, in, her, in his or her body, right? She was afoot. And she gathered people. She gathered people in a town called Florence and in other towns in Italy, but primarily Florence. And something began, which was a new emergence. And they called this new emergence the Renaissance. And it was a Renaissance of what it means to be a human being. It was a Renaissance of human knowing. It was a renaissance on how we gather knowledge. It was a renaissance of what it means to be a woman. It was a renaissance of what the relationship is between our finitude, our mortality, right? Our bodies, right? And the larger universe, the larger cosmos. 
It was a new story of relationship. It was a new story of Eros. That Renaissance was deeply influenced by a set of hidden mystery schools, which have been documented historically in any number of very important monographs. And these mystery schools were schools of interior science that found their way from the esoteric movements in the great traditions, not the public faces of the religions, but their esoteric movements in which there was an understanding of a deep sense, a new sense of cosmos that couldn't be spoken in the medieval era. And that comes to Florence and begins to shape and reshape the story of man, the story of woman, right? The story of God, the story of humanity. And, and the beginning of a, a new human, right? And a new humanity begins to emerge. And that story was able to respond to modernity. That story was the story of modernity. It was the story of the scientific method, right? It was the story of the emergence of the feminine. It was the story of the reclaiming of the human body. It was a new story of human desire that began, just began to be told. It was a story of human majesty, of the ability to steal fire from heaven and to actually light up, light a flame, planet Earth with, with human possibility. And imagine what happened. We went from a few hundred million people and we gradually, as technology deepened, and as our capacity to answer the question of how, how should we do it, deepened, we increased, we multiplied, right? We became literally not a half a billion to a billion, right? And then to, right, two billion, and then to four billion, and just, just in 1970, it was just four billion, right? And then to almost 8 billion and will be by the end, right? The next 10, 20 years, 30 years, we'll be at 10 billion. Now, that's wild. That's an explosion of life that's unimaginable. That's an explosion of human possibility. It's an explosion of uniqueness. It's an explosion of creativity, right? It's an explosion of possibility. And it brought with it all of the dignities of modernity. But it also brought with it all of the disasters of modernity. And let's see if we can get really quiet in the house. No side noise, really quiet. And kind of go into this deep quiet and understand what happened. Because one mountain is in response to what happened. Exterior technologies exponentialized. Our ability to answer the question of how became magisterial. We were able to measure. We moved from, in the medieval and classical period, classification. Aristotle did classification. We moved from classification to measurement. Kepler, Galileo, Newton, they begin to measure the laws of motion, gravitational measurements, electromagnetism. And the world of measurement enters into reality and measurement creates modern science. And measurement and our capacity to create technological capacity unleashes unimaginable possibility, possibilities of, of human flourishing, possibilities of human power, and simply possibilities of humanity from a half a billion to eight billion human beings, eight billion loci of creativity and eros and goodness and truth and beauty. It's an unimaginable explosion. And at the same time, after an initial upsurge, an initial retelling of the human story, which ushers in unimaginable good, the abolition of slavery, the new sciences, penicillin, universal human rights, right? A beginning of a sense of this new story of modernity. 
But after that initial outburst, interior technologies actually grind to a standstill. We don't manage to root our assertion of human, universal human rights in, an, in a true story of value. We declare them, but we're not sure why they're true. We don't manage to actually begin to tell a new story of human dignity. We begin to measure the human being. We measure the human being. We commodify the human being. The human being is actually commanded self-commodify according to a standard of measurement in which you are productive in this new society. And if you're not productive in a certain way that's commodifiable and that's measurable, we're actually not really sure what your value is. You begin to see? And we declare human value, but we don't ground human value in a new story of value. We actually stop in some fundamental way believing in intrinsic value. We actually declare value to be a human creation. We cease to locate value in the fields of infinite value. We correctly rebel against the old religions that each one hijacked value, that each one said we own value and everyone else is excluded from the field of value. We hijacked, right, we, we hijacked value as being our own ethnocentric property. Modernity rebels against that hijacking, declares value to be universal, but then also unmoors value from the infinite. And let me say it even more deeply, right? Modernity unmoors finitude from the infinite. Finitude is our experience of our humanity. Humanity becomes unmoored from its location in eternity. Time is divorced from eternity. Eternity begins to be understood as everlasting time instead of something which is beneath time and beneath space. Instead of eternity being the field of value, instead of eternity being the Tao, right? The Tao is the field of value in which all of us live. We have this distorted experience of having stepped out of the Tao, stepped out of the field of value. We declare a value but it's no longer moored in this ultimate field of value. Value becomes contrived. And from David Hume and on, the understanding that value is contrived actually is the center of the human experience. And it goes from David Hume, right, to certain readings of Immanuel Kant, and then it goes and is amplified by neo-Darwinism, and then it finds its way to all sorts of forms of logical positivism, all sorts of forms of contemporary 19th century relativism. And then it finds its way to contemporary existentialism in the 20th century, right? All the way to post-modernity, right? That thread actually dislocates the human being from the story of value that is cosmos. Now, when you dislocate the human being from the story of value, then you dislocate the human being from the immeasurable. You dislocate the human being from the priceless. You dislocate the human being from the field of the sacred, that which can't be reduced, that which can't be commodified. Because the Tao that can be commodified is not the Tao. The Tao that can be measured, right, is not the Tao. The Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao. The Tao is that moment in which we exchange a glance and we're blown away by each other's beauty. And that moment is priceless. That moment is immeasurable. That moment is filled with depth and it's filled with goodness and it's filled with truth and it's filled with beauty, but it's not hijackable for utilitarian measure, for utilitarian purpose. It is the end in and of itself. It's non-instrumental. It's that moment, not when we answer the question of why we're alive, it's the moment when the questions fall away, right? It's not in order to network. It's not in order to help my capacity to self-commodify. It's not in order to allow me to succeed more efficiently in the rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, which modernity introduced as the overarching world story 
governed by win-lose metrics, meaning measurable, to replace the Tao. No, no, no. The moments that are immeasurable, the moments that are priceless, when our personhood is in full bloom, when we're fully alive, when we don't need to answer right, the questions because the questions have fallen away, but at least we're asking the right questions. We're not asking any more the questions of how, we're asking an entirely new set of questions. Can you feel that? And when you, an when you ask the right questions, it leads you to experiences in which the questions themselves fall away. Yes, we, we respond to the questions. Yes, we articulate. And we're going we're gonna to ask three great questions today. We're not going to do any evolutionary sermons. We do evolutionary sense makings. Sermons is a word from the past. We're, we've moved from sermons to sense makings. We're going to be doing every week evolutionary sense makings. And those evolutionary sense makings are going to be about what is the new story of value? Because not only did modernity introduce dignities, and introduced disasters. You see, when we lost our connection to the story of value, what we call the story of value rooted in first principles and first values, we lost our connection to that story because we rebelled against right, the pre-modern religions who had each hijacked a version of that story and made it an ethnocentric triumphalist story in which I'm on the inside and you're on the outside. And my essential experience with being on the inside comes from placing you on the outside, and therefore I have the right to murder you. Therefore, I have the right to kill you for the sake of God. Therefore, I have the right to make you subject to Dar el Harb because you're not part of Dar el Islam. You're part of the nation of the sword, not part of the nation of Islam, or in Augustine's version, there's no redemption outside of the church. Various versions from Tibetan Buddhism to Judaism to Christianity to Islam to Confucianism, right, to Buddhism, various versions of we're the chosen people. And you're not. And so in the rebellion, in the modern rebellion against that, we actually threw out the baby with the bathwater, right? We threw out the, the old and broken versions of the field of value, but then we dislocated ourselves from the field of value entirely. And we stopped actually believing in value. We stopped actually trusting the immeasurable. And all of us began to live world over, whether in open societies or closed societies, we began to live in a success story. Does everyone get that? And it's all of us in some way or another trying to identify, are we successful? And then we have to measure that success. And that success is in some sense governed by rivalrous conflict between ourselves and others in which we have to stand out. And our standing out is governed by win-lose metrics. We're winning, you're losing. We're competing, but it's a zero-sum competition. And there's only room for, for a very small amount of winners. And, and that which is immeasurable, that which is most precious, precious, that is, which is most resplendent, that which is the jewel that is filled with radiant and luminous beauty, right? Those moments of our lives in which the questions fall away, those cease to have meaning. And we're lost in this race for self-commodification. But it's not just a personal race, it becomes a communal race. It's nation against nation. It's a win-lose metrics that pits nation against nation. It pits divisions and companies against divisions and companies. It pits open societies against closed societies. And everything begins to be governed by that win-lose metrics. And then what happens is we keep developing. We keep developing technologies that we shouldn't develop. But those technologies are now exponential. They're now technologies of Mass destruction. They're, they're now technologies that can be weaponized, not just a nuclear bomb, but technologies that can be weaponized by rogue non-state actors, right? Technologies of artificial intelligence, which is far more dangerous than the climate, that, that are actually available, that actually suborn, they actually subvert, right? All of the classical notions that we understand society to be, right? A society run by machine intelligence, social credit system in China, in the Western world, various versions of internally imposed social credit systems governed by social media. But the open society and the closed society introduces versions of, of control, right? Versions of virtually totalitarian imposition in which human free will 
is actually subverted, in which actually my desires and preferences are measured, commodified by machine intelligence, which creates micro-targeted, personalized personality profiles on me, which sequences ads of every manner, in particular ways split testing them against my particular predilections and preferences in order to get me to make decisions that actually I may well not want to make, but I have no idea that I'm actually arrayed against a machine intelligence that has the capacity to play the top thousand chess masters in the world at one time and beat all of them resoundingly, that machine intelligence capacity is actually arrayed against my personhood, arrayed against my free will, arrayed against my capacity to, to go into the inward space of meaning and find the field of value. That machine intelligence is actually not living in the field of value. It's completely commodified, privatized in the West, owned by the state, in the closed societies, but actually beginning to dominate the very space of reality. And those forms of, for example, generalized artificial intelligence, according to the best literatures today, actually have the largest capacity to actually create possibilities of existential risk, risk to our essential humanity, right? risk to our essential existence on planet Earth. That's just one example of existential risk, of catastrophic risk, part of a larger meta crisis in which the extraction models and the exponential growth curves that have actually dominated reality, the false creations of currency, the false distributions of resources amplified by a fossil fuel boom, which amplified the population, which is actually not sustainable. And the list goes on. All of those are the disasters of modernity. And we're trying to figure out how to address those disasters. And there's all sorts of movements in the world trying to say, we've got to fix the infrastructure. We've got to fix the social structure. Infrastructure means right, solutions to the very infrastructure of the planet, new technologies that can check for you know, bioweapons right, in the wastewater. Right? That's an example of an infrastructure, social structure, right? some sort of council of elders that perhaps will, will guide reality. And perhaps there's representatives of the future somehow symbolically on the council. That's a new social structure. Possibilities of world government, which is frightening because world government needs to have a monopoly on force and a monopoly on force creates a monopoly on power. So the, the imposition of a totalitarianism of an even greater kind right, becomes very dangerous. So what do we do? What do we do at this complex moment in time? How do we actually respond to the disasters of modernity that bring us face to face with a level of existential risk and catastrophic risk? the ultimate disaster of modernity that we've never faced in humanity before, that brings before a world in which we know that every local civilization has fallen. We haven't solved the problems of local civilizations, which means extraction of resources or governance right, crises. We haven't solved any of those. We've now moved to a global civilization. The global civilization is now completely non-local, but that global civilization has exponential technologies which are not guided by wisdom. They're not guided by interior technologies. There's no one actually minding the shop. There's no one actually looking at, okay, which version of artificial intelligence should we allow development of and in what way in order to make sure that we'll actually exist in 50 years. Right? And, and even if we sign a treaty saying we're not gonna develop a particular form of weaponized exponential technology, we develop it anyways because there's a race to the bottom is what we call a multipolar trap, meaning we're sure that someone else is going to do it. So we need to do it because it's rivalrous conflict based on win-lose metrics. And we're not intimate with the other. We don't have a shared intimacy with them. So we can't actually make agreements that we can trust. We don't have a shared intimacy because, because what? And, and this is where one mountain many paths begins the conversation. This was all introduction. Because what? Because we don't have a shared story of value rooted in first principles and first values. This is the essence of the whole story, okay? Now let's, let's like, wow, right? We're all new here. We're all starting from the beginning. We're all, we're rebooting. We're gonna start this conversation again and we're gonna deepen it, right, immeasurably. We're gonna be in a joy that's unimaginable this year. We're gonna be in a sense of ecstatic urgency that's unimaginable. We're not gonna go into a kind of doomer depression 
right, or a kind of gloomy sense, right, of, of unimaginable grief in which we actually step out of the game. We're actually going to step fully in, ecstatically urgent, filled with joy, because we actually know that there's actually a way in. We're actually hopeful. We actually have a way to engage, right, this metacrisis. And we're going, we're going to engage this metacrisis, if I can borrow the term from Marvin Harris, not through merely infrastructure, although that's clearly necessary, not through social structure, but through superstructure. And what superstructure means is, although Marvin Harris didn't exactly intend it this way, I'm borrowing it and revisioning it. What superstructure means is we're going to tell a new story of value rooted in first principles and first values. And I put that in quotation marks. That's a quotation marks. We're going to tell, quote, a new story of value rooted in first principles and first values. And it's only a new story of value rooted in first principles and first values that actually brings us together, that creates intimacy between us. Let's say you're in a couple. If the couple doesn't have a shared vision of value, there's no intimacy between them. Whether you're in a company, a corporation, an organization, a community, right, local or global, if there's no shared story of value, there's no intimacy. And so really, if you look at the core, all of our existential risks are based on this sense of A, rivalrous conflict rooted in win-lose metrics. That's number one. And B, rivalrous conflict rooted in win-lose metrics generates this race to the bottom, generates multipolar traps, generates a kind of pseudo-erotic consumption to cover over the emptiness, which that drives our extraction models for power and profit, right? Which are driven by exponential technologies, right? Which extract that which took billions of years for the planet to create. We actually hit planetary boundaries and exceed and violate planetary boundaries. And we create complicated systems, fragile systems, in which we have vast amounts of people going on 10 billion people, but all of them involved in their own private or communal win-lose metrics, rivalrous conflict against everyone surrounding them. That's actually the superstructure. That's the interior source code of the planet right now. And that's the core of the metacrisis. You can't solve the metacrisis through social structure alone or through infrastructure alone. We can only engage the metacrisis, right friends, through actually a new superstructure, meaning quotation marks, a new story of value rooted in first principles and first values. In every word we're gonna have to talk about this year. What do we mean by value? What do we mean by story? What do we mean by first principles and first values? Those, those are all going to be critical. But for now, let's just say that it's only simple first principles and first values rooted in a or embedded in a story of value that has the capacity to change the vector of history. But that's not, that's not bad news. That's insanely hopeful. That's once you have the diagnosis, you're, you're three quarters of the way to the healing. When we actually realize, and this is not in your local newspaper, it's not on right, you know, the, the agenda of, of the think tanks. It's not available right, in social media. You can listen to all the podcasts in the world. This is not the conversation. The conversation right, in the think tank world revolves around all sorts of social structure and infrastructure world, worlds. But that's, that's not gonna take us home. It's not gonna get us there. The only thing that's going to get us there, the only thing that ever changes the vector of history is actually addressing its source code. And the source code of reality is story and value. And story and value are actually, as we're going to see in the course of this year, are actually the same thing. We'll talk about that later. If I change the story of value, if I introduce value again, meaning I step back into the Tao, but not the pre-modern Tao, not the ethnocentric Tao, not the Tao in which God is a puppet in the sky, or God puppets us, excuse me, from the sky, and we're emasculated. But it's got to be a God who's both holding us and a God and a goddess in whom we participate. We have to be participatory, right, in the field of value, which is the divine field, even as that field holds us and calls us and demands from us. We need to tell this new story. We got to tell this new story of value, but not because it's one that we contrived or one that we made up. It's because we've actually entered so deeply right into the source code of the best wisdom streams of pre-modernity and the deepest, most validated insights of the wisdom streams, the most validated insights of pre-modernity, the most validated insights of modernity 
the most validated insights of post-modernity, which has important contributions to make, we then weave them together. We weave the parts together into a new emergent, a new synergistic emergent. That new synergistic emergent is this new story of value. And this new story of value, right, needs to and can and will become the new source code. So let's see if we can get it even more clearly, okay? Can we jump one more step, one more step, friends? And it's gorgeous, it's insane, it's beautiful, and it's stunning. So what are we saying? We're saying that we're living now in a complicated system. And this complicated system is governed by win-lose metrics. It's ribose conflict governed by win-lose metrics. It produces this complicated, fragile system, right? So that, that creates, right, both of those. A complicated system means the parts of the system don't know each other. They're not familiar with each other. They're not friends with each other. Something happens, a financial instrument's created in the Far East that collapses, right, mortgages in the United States. Right? There's no intimacy between the parts of the system. I solve one existential risk, but by solving one, I create another one. Right? I, I seem to solve COVID by stopping jet travel, but then I create starvation in major parts of the world because the supply chain breaks down. Right? And then millions of people die in a different way. And it's, we actually have to see the whole thing. We have to see the whole system. We have to swallow it whole. And we have to create intimacy, a sense of global intimacy. Right now, there's a global intimacy disorder. It's a complicated system and what one part of the system doesn't recognize, doesn't feel. There's no shared value, there's no shared purpose between the different parts of the system, right? Win-lose metrics, again, intimacy disorder, right? It's me against you, it's an I-it relationship, said Boober. There's no intimacy, meaning there's no shared identity between us. So we need to restore intimacy, right? If the root, right? In other words, we generally talk about everything as rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics that generates a complicated system those are the two generator functions for existential risk. But we now realize there's a deeper root. There's a root disorder underneath rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. And underneath complicated systems, there's, there's a more root cause. And that root cause is a global intimacy disorder. And that global intimacy disorder itself is rooted in something even deeper, which is that which collapses intimacy, which is no shared value. Right? Between a couple, you can have the best sexual potential in the world and you can have the deepest psychological conversations and your intimacy will collapse. And it'll collapse if there's not a shared field of value. Right? It's only a shared field of value that generates intimacy. And polarization in the contemporary conversation comes from the collapse in the field of value. So we need to actually respond to the global intimacy disorder by actually not restoring an ancient global intimacy. There never was global intimacy. But it never existed. So we need to generate a new order of intimacy. We need to generate a new possibility of intimacy. Does everyone get that? We need to generate an evolutionary intimacy that's never existed on the history of planet Earth before. Wow. We need to tell a new story of value rooted in first principles and first values, which has the capacity to heal the global intimacy disorder by generating a new emergent of intimacy unrivaled, unimagined in all previous human history. Because we again are in a Da Vinci moment. We're in a time between worlds. We're in a time between stories. But this time, we're not talking about the Black Death, which destroyed half of Europe, but ultimately could not take humanity down. We're talking about exponentialized technologies distributed to rogue non-state actors, right, of at least 10 different kinds that have the capacity to actually take down the future itself. Right? The future itself now right, is about to disappear, right? about to disappear in, in an eminent and genuine possibility right? because, because we in the present don't have a shared story of value. So therefore, we're lost in this intimacy disorder. So it's only by generating a shared story of value that we can generate global intimacy. And global intimacy means we're intimate with every person on planet Earth. So therefore, we can generate between us coherence. We don't deal with COVID on a state-by-state -state basis when we have a virus that obviously doesn't honor the sovereign boundaries, how absurd is that, right, of contrived states, right? We actually, every single global challenge, every single one without exception, requires global coordination. And you cannot have global coordination without global coherence. And you cannot have global coherence without resonance, global resonance between the parts. And you can't have global resonance between the parts without global intimacy. 
And you can't have global intimacy. Instead, you have a global intimacy disorder. You can't have global intimacy without a shared story of value rooted in first principles and first values. Right? Does that make sense? Wow. So what that means is, I mean, let's, let's talk about this for a second. That means the most effective altruism, if I can borrow a term that was introduced by students of Derek Parfit in Oxford, right? The most effective altruism, right? The most consequentialist altruism that can affect more than any other philanthropy that you do. Philanthropy with your time, philanthropy with your money, philanthropy with your, your energetic resources, philanthropy with your creativity, philanthropy with your attention, philanthropy with your focus, philanthropy with your love, with your eros, philanthropy with your feeling, the most effective altruism, the most effective philanthropy, the most effective erotic move in cosmos today, that which generates eros and cosmos, which has to be the move of every interior scientist and every erotic mystic and every outrageous lover, everyone who's willing because it's the people who feel the flutter of being omniconsiderate for the sake of the whole. It's the people who kind of feel the crisis, who actually are not satisfied to go on with the daily rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, who don't want to post-COVID get back to life as usual, business as normal. We actually understand that COVID was just a dress rehearsal for catastrophic and existential risk. We're willing to step in and, and be the holy band and be the spiritual society. Right and be right the the band of outrageous lovers and be right the people that we've been waiting for. It's only that group of people, and that group of people are self chosen. It's not the priests, right? And it's not the moneyed class, and it's not the merchants, and right? it's not those who are kind of multi generational, you know, wealth, you know, the blue bloods of various societies. It's not royalty. It's the realization that royalty today, royalty today, the kings and queens today, with all due respect, Charles. Right? The kings and queens today are self-chosen. It's those of us who feel a flutter, right? Even when it's a faint flutter. It's those of us who, are, who feel called, who feel that we can't look away. We can't look away. We have to step in. We realize that actually it's ours to do. That in every generation, there's people who, who came together to actually take responsibility for the whole. But now, now the whole actually is threatened. And actually, we are the only voice of the future. Right? We're the, the, fu the only voice of the future is us. It's those of us who say we're actually willing to be intimate with the future, right? right? We're intimate with the future. We actually can hear the voice of the unborn calling to us. And, and we understand that the only response to this global empathy disorder, which is the root cause of, of actually existential and catastrophic risk, which is the generator of rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose win metrics, it's the generator of the fragile systems. The only response is to generate this new story of value. And this new story of value has to include intimacy with the past, with all of the validated insights of all the wisdom streams of the past. It has to include intimacy with, with the present, with all of the people of the past, all of the best validated insights of the past, with all of the validated insights of the present and all of the, the people of the present, right? All over, world over. No states, no blocks, no closed societies, no open societies, right? A shared story of value. Right, embedded in a shared right, set of first principles and first values, evolving first principles and first values. And we'll talk about that later in the year. Right, it's only that new story that can actually generate global intimacy. And it's only that global intimacy that can allow us to actually overcome what's now a mixture of global action paralysis and global action confusion. So this is the moment right, to be an effective altruist. This is the moment to be a philanthropist. To be a philanthropist with, with, with all the resource, which is source awake and alive in we, in she, in thee, right? In this unique self symphony, and that rhymed, okay? It's ours to do, right? We are the people that we've been waiting for. This is ours to do all the way, right? We can actually tell this new story of value. We can weave these insights. We can gather around the campfire of humanity and then tell a story that's so compelling because it integrates all the wisdom streams. It's Darwin level, Freud level in terms of its, its level of empirical research. It's Einstein level in terms of its interior mathematics of intimacy. Right? We need to actually not do a bestseller book that's competing. We need to actually do a great library to actually re-soul reality. We need to re-soul, right? to re-entrance reality right? into the Tao.
into the realization that we're living in that field of value. So, wow, that's a big deal. That's the great library of cosmetic humanism. That's, that's what we're doing. So we're engaged in an, in an insane project of, 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 of sanity. It's an insanity, which is the only sanity. And we come together, we're going to come together every week this year, right, in One Mountain, Many Paths. And, and we're going to try and address three questions. It's going to be the core of the year, three questions. We call them the three great questions of cosmoronic humanism. And, and today we're just going to introduce the questions. That's what we're going to do. We're just going to introduce the first week. We're starting, right? And I want to, I want to just thank the, the incredible, wondrous, beyond imagination, right? You know, people who, who stepped in this summer and, and, and shared the Dharma as it moves and shared these new principles and first values as it moves through their body, through their unique prism. The first week, Terry Nelson. And then, then for two weeks going, Tom Ronane Goddard and then Jacqueline Clark and Kirsten Zohar. And then Suzette Mason, Jamie Long, and then Krista Joseph and, and Christina Tahel and David A. Tan every week, right, leading prayer. So I'm going to thank the just incredible Unique Self Symphony that's been going actually the last seven weeks, right? Thank you, like deep bow, deep, oh my God. And we're going to step in together this year and we're going to engage, and this is not a normal podcast, right? And it's not a church service, right? This is the hub and the heart of revolution. Right? This is the revolution. Right? And the revolution is those people who say we're not willing to accept the status quo because the status quo is, is imminent catastrophic risk, for sure, an existential risk, very significant possibility. And so we feel the voices of the unborn, the trillions of unborn, men, women, and children. We feel the suffering of the present along with the great dignity and wonder and beauty of the present. We feel our responsibility to stand in our covenant between generations. There's a covenant between the generations, so we're actually responsible to the past. The past has passed its baton to us. And so we're in that place, we're in that pivoting point, it's us. And we are the ones we've been waiting for. We're awake, we're alive. We're not willing to turn away. And why are you here? Why am I here? We're here because we chose each other. Can you feel that? Can you hear that? We chose each other. We chose to be in unique self-symphony with each other. We're not, we're not willing to turn away. We're willing to actually face into right, the most dire possibility, but not with a sense of kind of doomer-like abandon, right? Which is, which is common in intellectual circles throughout the world today. No, 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 not at all. Because we realize that the same evolutionary impulse, the same creative eros, that was inherent in reality in the first nanoseconds of the Big Bang is quite literally awake and alive in us in this very precise and exact moment. Literally, that which generated the world of matter and that which generated the world of life and that which generated the depths of the human self-reflective mind, that evolutionary impulse lives in us, as us, and through us. And we actually understand that evolution, which is but one face of the infinite divine. That evolution is the possibility of possibility. That's what evolution is. Evolution is, is not all of God. Evolution is the face of divine becoming. Right? The face of eros unfolding, the shekhinah, right? The eros of reality. The shekhinah is a Hebrew mystical term in the interior sciences for the creative eros of reality rooted in the infinite, but that unfolds finitude, desiring ever more expressions and ever wider expressions of eros, creativity, goodness, truth, beauty, and love. That's the erotic motive of the cosmos. That's the erotic motive of the cosmos that generates ever increasing orders of value, ever increasing orders of goodness, ever increasing orders of eros, ever increasing orders of truth, ever increasing orders of beauty. I mean, that's the love story of reality. And we participate in that love story. It's not a Pollyannish love story. It's not a new age love story. It's not a fundamentalist regressive love story, but it is a reality driven by evolutionary eros. And evolutionary eros itself in its very inherent nature, based, based on the best emergent sciences, right, that actually dominate, right, and actually define reality in the last 150, 200 years, what emergent science tells us is that reality is the possibility of possibility. Another way of saying that is reality, the real, or God, right, or eros, is the possibility of possibility. And that possibility of possibility lives in us, as us, and through us. And when we gather, 
and we love each other madly, not casually, not superciliously, not as in a, a way of networking, when we actually commit to each other, we say, I'm in, I'm in. And we answer the question, this is the question we ask, and we're gonna ask it every week in One Mountain. And the question is, are we willing to play a larger game? Are we willing? And let's find each other in the chat box. Are we willing to play a larger game? Who's willing? Are we willing? If you're willing, just write, I am willing, or yes. Yes, right, I am willing. We're stepping in, right? The year begins in a new way. We're in September, right? I am willing, are we willing? We are willing. Are we willing to play a larger game? Are we willing to participate in the evolution of love? Are we willing to participate in the evolution of love? Are we willing to be as unique selves and as unique self symphony, the personal face of the evolutionary impulse living in us, as us and through us, standing at the edge of darkness and proclaiming in a way that's never been proclaimed before, let there be light, the light of a new story of value rooted in first values and first principles. And you know what? Here, here it is, right? What it takes to change the world first is the trust, the knowing that we can do it. And we can, and we can, because we are in this moment and we are here in one mountain, many paths. We are audaciously and humbly, we're filled with humility. We know that she moves in us, as us, and through us. We know that, that we are on our knees, right, to the larger forces of universe and to the great mystery. And we're filled with audacity for that very same reason. Because we know she's moving through us. Because we trust, right, we trust her and we trust her voice in us. And because we clarify again and again and we challenge ourselves and we come together and the guru at the center of this enterprise is the unique self symphony itself. It is the first principles and first values themselves. It is the sacred text of the great library that we're going to evolve together as an evolving new story of value, which is not a monolithic story imposed, right? It's a new story of value as a context for our diversity. It's a new story of value as a context for our diversity, as opposed to a closed society that imposes a story, which is a contrived artificial story, which is not rooted in the actual facts and truths of reality. An open society will collapse, and open societies are collapsing unless open societies actually self-organize and self-actualize, right, by actually rallying around a new story of value, which then becomes a context for diversity. Wow, right? It, it's beyond, right? It's fine, this, right? It's unimaginable. And you might think, could this be true? Are we out of our minds? Of course we're out of our minds, right? Of course we are, but we're out of our small mind. We're out of our contracted mind. We're out of our non-expanded mind. We're out of what's called mochen de katnut, right? The contraction of the separate self-ego that's lost in the rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. We're in our right minds, right? We're in ecstasis. We're, we're beside ourselves with joy. And we, we're going to live the dream every week. We're not going to go doomer. We're not going to go depression. We're not going to go inappropriate paralysis, right? Lost in a sense that We've already overshot the planetary boundaries and, and there's nothing to be done. There's everything to be done. Evolution is on the move in us, right? She is on the move in us. And are we evangelical? We are. We're evangelical in the best sense of the word, meaning we've got good news. And the good news is that value is real. And the good news is that, that Eros is the center of cosmos. And the good news is that every human being is an irreducible, unique self. And the good news is that each one of us has irreducibly dignity and, and unique gifts that are needed by all that is. That's good news. And so we are evangelical in the best sense of the word. And yet we're modern scientists and rational and sober right, and analytic in the best sense of the word. And we're postmodern in which we break and, and undermine and deconstruct stories of power, which are shams covering up ulterior motives. And instead, right, look to this post-postmodern moment to create this new story of value together in which everyone knows I've got a poem to write and a song to sing. And I'm actually not measured by my artificial commodifiability, but I'm actually seen, I'm evaluated, meaning my value is received by my capacity to give my unique gift and to play my unique instrument of the unique self symphony. And every man, woman, and child, every color in this global world and in this imminently galactic world, because we're moving from the global to the galactic and read Gary Nolan's research right, a, a professor at um, 
at Stanford University and who's doing some super important work, right? right? It's very, very clear, right, in the last 100 years, but in the last five years, there's been an explosion, right, of understanding in the mainstream that the galactic is real, meaning that, that, that there's a broader field, there's a wider field of life, right, beyond planet Earth. And in order to create a galactic civilization, because we're going to, we need to move to the global, and we're going to move from the global to the galactic, right? Nolan, N-O-L-A-N, Becca. We're going to move from the global to the galactic, and what's going to unite the galactic is a universal field of value. Right? That's, that's, that's actually the way we need to move, right? Because value is intrinsic to cosmos, and it's the context for our diversity. That's how we step in. That's how we heal the global intimacy disorder. That's how we introduce an eros and intimacy, which is unimaginable and which is the intention of cosmos itself and here's i want to i want to close with this i'm going to turn to david who's going to just read the code which is going to set the tone for the year and then we're going to come together and you know in communion and just offer prayer but prayer not to not to the the dominant emasculating god who puppets us but to the infinite divine to the infinity of intimacy that both lives in us and holds the whole thing. Because remember, long before there was a human neocortex, there was photosynthesis, which we barely understand. There was a chlorophyll molecule with all the exponential computers can't even begin to replicate. There was mitosis and meiosis. Right? The world evolution didn't become conscious with the modern notion of conscious evolution. The modern notion of conscious evolution is, as I was able to wonderfully revise it with my dear friend, Barbara Marks Hubbard, right, who co-founded One Mountain Together with me, Right? Conscious evolution means not that evolution becomes conscious. Evolution is always conscious. Right? It means that we become awake and aware that evolution is moving in us. Conscious ev evolution means we become conscious evolution. We are the incarnations of the evolutionary impulse. We know that we are evolution in person. Evolution doesn't live out there. Evolution lives in here. We are the evolutionary impulse alive. So it's on the move. So who can feel that? Before David reads the code, who can feel that it's on the move now? In one mountain, spirit is on the move. In one mountain, evolution is on the move. In one mountain, eros is on the move. In one mountain, outrageous love is on the move. In one mountain, audacity is on the move. In one mountain, humility, utter complete humility is on the move. Right? In one mountain, kindness is on the move. Right? In one mountain, the new story is on the move. In the one mountain, we are on the move together as a unique self-symphony. And at the core of what we do this year, we are on the move. We are on the move. And at the core of what we do this year is we're gonna respond on the move to three questions. Three questions, and David, right? And this is one of the codes, the evolutionary love codes, and this is the core of everything. Here's the three questions that we're gonna spend this year responding to. And I wanna just introduce one idea, one sentence, and we're gonna talk about this in more depth next week, but here's the sentence. In Complexity theory, the way you turn a complicated system, which I'm gonna call a non-intimate system, I'm gonna call a fragile system, the kind that Nassim Taleb describes a non-intimate system, a system that's de-eroticized. The way you turn a complicated system into an intimate system, and this is the core to Turing. Turing machines were the first computers. Turing was the greatest mathematician of his age. He was the code cracker, cracked the Nazi code and saved millions of lives. Right, in World War II, the core of Turing's essay written in 1947-48 at Bell Lab called Morphogenesis is that which causes a complicated system to self-organize into coherence is not a command and control system. It's not a closed society. It's actually simple first principles and first values. So my thesis for the last 10 years has been right, that actually that's true not only in exteriors, it's true in interiors that the way we need to self-organize and self-actualize reality is through simple first values and first principles. And some, we're gonna talk about that in depth next week. Simple first values and first principles are responses to three simple questions. So David, resonate the code, here we go. Oh my God. Wow. All right, here's the code. This week's evolutionary love code. There are three great questions in life. The first question is, where am I? The second question is, who am I and who are you? The third question is, what is there to do? 
The response to these three great questions is the source of all joy, all power, all arrows, all creativity, all goodness, all truth, and all beauty. The response to these three great questions is the set of first principles and first values that are the North Star of a great life well lived. We call these three questions the three great questions of cosmoerotic humanism. Cosmoerotic humanism is the story of the new human and the new humanity. Cosmoerotic humanism is the expression of what may be the most potent and powerful self-understanding that humanity has ever been able to articulate. So with that, it's a pleasure to turn my word back to you, Dr. Mark, and welcome back. Right, right. It's insanely good to be with you, brother. And thank you for that kind of insanely beautiful code. So what are we saying? We're saying that the cosmorotic humanism is our name for the new story of value. So think um, my dear friend and colleague who founded with us the, you know, the, the, we first called this the Center for World Spirituality back in 2009, uh, 2010. And, and then we, we renamed it as the Center for Integral Wisdom. So Ken and I co-founded right, the center together. So Ken enacted something called integral theory. So integral theory is a critical scaffolding. So cosmoerotic humanism includes the deepest structures of integral theory, right? As well as a number of other critical pieces of meta-theoretical work, meta-theories. Cosmoerotic, cosmoerotic humanism integrates multiple meta-theories into a new story of value and actually tells that story. So it's something more akin to romanticism or existentialism. Right, or even you might call something the spirit of modernity. So it's actually a new story of value. That's what cosmorotic humanism is. But at its core, at the core to the, the core of the new story is a set of simple first principles and first values, which are answers to the three great questions of cosmorotic humanism. And what are they? They're simple. Where? Where am I? Right? Where am I? Right? What, what's the nature of this reality I live in? Where am I? What town am I living in? Hello, where am I? You can't get anywhere without knowing, where am I? I need a map, I need to orient. Where am I? What's the nature and quality of this reality? It's what Einstein meant when he said, is the universe friendly? It means where am I? Two, who am I? And who are you? Right, so there's a where question in the cosmos. That's the universe story question. There's the who story in the cosmos, which is who am I and who are you, right? And, Right? And, and therefore, what's our relationship? Who? Who are you? Who am I? Who are we? It's all the same question. It's the who question. And then there's the what question. Once I got where and I got who, what? What's there to do? And what is there to do is rooted in what do I really want? What do I really desire? What do I really need? Right? So the what question has these, these two sub-questions. What do I want? What do I need? And, and what's the relationship between want, desire, and need? Okay, so three questions, but you understand, we understand those are simple questions and the responses have to be simple, but simple means not made up, not a conjecture, but what we call second simplicity, right? First simplicity, dogma, pre-modernity, modern dogma, postmodern dogma, made up conjecture, declaration, lost in a kind of adolescent rebellion, often appropriate, right, against previous authorities, whether it's pre-modernity, modernity rebelling against pre-modernity, post-modernity rebelling against modernity. No, we can't do that. Not those kind of, not that kind of first simplicity. No, we need second simplicity. We've got to move from first simplicity to complexity, meaning we got to study everything. That's what we're trying to do at the center. We're trying to actually engage deeply in all sectors of human knowing from the traditional period, the modern period and the postmodern period as best we can and get a sense of the, the, the basic validated insights of each of them, then weave them together in this new story of value embedded, rooted in first principles and first values. And that new story has got to be a story we can teach to a 10 year old. We can study right in seminary or in academia, right? Or in a wisdom school or a mystery school, we can study it for 50 years and, and not exhaust its depth. And we can actually share it with 50 truckers in China. And we can share it in, in the depth of Russia and we can share it all over Europe and we can share it in Antarctica and we can share it in red states and blue states in the United States. It's a shared story of value in which we realize that which unites us is so much greater 
that which divides us, that we are evolution, that we are the people we've been waiting for. Wow. Those are the three questions we're going to focus on this year as an expression of simple first principles and first values that we first articulate here together. And then we generate the resources to, to translate them into the, the great library. And then we download those into the very source code of culture and they become self-evident all over culture. Just like a thousand years ago, democracy was absurd. A democracy got burned at the stake for su suggesting democracy as a form of governance. How absurd people would actually decide, right? <clears throat> the nature of their governance. It was a complete absurd and ridiculous idea. But, but now it's, it's a self-evident given. We're, of course, we're losing touch with authentic democracy for other reasons, different conversation. But, but the notion of democracy is right. And it's self-evident, right, to my 12-year-old son, right, who's upstairs, and to seven-year-olds all over the Western world, right, and to many, many people, right, in the closed societies who yearn for democracy. It's self-evident because consciousness has evolved. Because actually, the only thing that changes, and the only thing that changes in the world is everything. Right? right? The only steady, unchanging truth in the world is that it all changes. So it's not that it's going to remain static. It's not going to remain static. It is on the move. And we see exterior technologies on the move. Now we need interior technologies to be on the move. We're in the Renaissance. We're not repeating the canards of yesterday. We are Da Vinci. We are Ficinio. Right? We are doing this together. We are the band that gathers. It's intense. Right? It's intense. It's intense. But it's real. It's more real than anything. Okay? So you see, friends, right? We can pray together. We pray together. We turn to the infinity of intimacy that knows our name. Next week, we're going to start formal prayer. We're going to talk about what prayer is and how it operates and how prayer is not a pre-modern idea. And prayer is not a fundamentalist idea. We're going to actually reintegrate prayer into the very source code of contemporary consciousness because we need meditation. We need contemplation and we need prayer because we can't do this ourselves. We can't do this ourselves. We need to partner. And we need to be finitude partnering with infinity. We need to be partnering with goddess herself. We are goddess's partner and she is our partner. She both lives in us, evolution lives in us, and she holds us. And in that notion of the infinity of intimacy that knows our name is actually itself a first principle and first value of cosmos that's gotten lost. And, and we need to reclaim it and elevate it, right? And evolve it. Okay, so next week we're going to start formal prayer, right? At the end, at the very end, we're actually going to each have an opportunity just right in the chat box and offer a prayer or pray quietly. But for now, we're just going to end with a, a simple chant written by a, by a wonderful band, right? Who said, oh my God, we found love in a hopeless place, right? We found love in a hopeless place because that's what we're doing. We're stepping into the doomer mentality that says, abandon the world. We're stepping into, right, the turning away. And we're saying, no, 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 right? We are the hope, right? Hope is a memory of the future. And we are a memory of the future. And the memory of the future is the new story of value that includes past, present, and future that integrates the best of everything, the most validated insights, and the most gorgeous world. Right? We're going to create the most gorgeous world together that we know is possible. So we end. Maybe we can see everybody who's ever here. We can turn on the song, but let's see everyone. We can dance a little bit. We can find each other. This is just our first week just saying hello to each other. We're just saying hi. We're just reorienting. We're just locating ourselves. Maybe we can kind of see everyone. Right? And right? oh my God, right? if we can put it on, we have found love together. Eros, the universal love story in a hopeless place.